Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. So my name is Hakan Karateke. I'll be introducing our speaker for the third, uh, well, it's not a panel, it's a, uh, it's, a, it's going to be a lecture this time. Uh, Deborah, uh, Deborah Kap Chan, right? right. Uh, is a so she is Associate Professor of Performance Studies at New York University. She's also affiliated with the Departments of Anthropology and Middle Eastern Studies and, and Music. She obtained her PhD in 1992 in folklore studies from the University of Pennsylvania. She has several fellowships and honors. I will only list a few, the recent ones. Uh, American Institute of Margaret Studies Fellow, 1997. Uh, Fulbright Pace Fellow, Rabat, Morocco, 2002-2003. And, uh, and uh, Guggenheim Fellow, she was uh, in 2000. Um, I do not know how she manages it, but uh, as far as I can see, Prof Professor Kapchan's work is strikingly interdisciplinary, combining painstaking ethnographic research with theories and methodologies of music, performance, folklore, and women's studies, not to forget linguistics, for which she holds an MA from Ohio University. Her research is extensively concentrated on North Africa, and especially Morocco, out of which she produced her first book, an ethnographic study of women's performance genres in Beni Malal, a, a, a town in central Morocco. The book is titled Gender on the Market, Moroccan Women and the Revoicing of Tradition, which was published by the University of Pennsylvania Press in 1996. Uh, it's a study of a Moroccan it's a study of Moroccan women's expressive culture and analyzes the ways in which the women of this town respond to current transformations in gender roles, such as the emergence in the marketplace, which traditionally is considered a Moroccan male institution. The book further eliminates how gender and commodity relations are experienced and, inter uh, and interpreted in women's aesthetic and demonstrates how Moroccan women challenge some of the most basic cultural assumptions of their society, especially those concerning power and authority. This book was selected by the Choice magazine as an outstanding academic book for 1996. A recent book is titled Traveling Spirit Masters, Moroccan Music and Trends in the Global Marketplace. Uh, Professor Kafchan's uh, uh, Professor Kapchan looks in this book, which was published in 2007 by Western University Press, at the Gnaba, who are a group of ritual musicians and former slave, slaves brought from sub-Saharan Africa to Maghreb. The Gnaba are believed to have... Can you hear me this down? Uh, the Gnaba are believed to have healing power, especially with people who are thought to be possessed. They use incense, uh, music, and trance for their healing practices. The Gnaba also have a more global presence in that they participate in the world music market through collaborations with African-American jazz musicians and French artists. Prof Professor Kapchan's book looks at these collaborations and brings interpretations to the racial and mu musical identities on both sides of the Atlantic. Her narrative focuses on pro pro properties of trance and the sacred music, how gestures and the body and the senses were utilized in their performances. But Professor Kafjan also has numerous articles on related topics such as sound, narrative and poetics. Sufis, sacred music and Sufi performances in Morocco have been in the core of her research all along, but I understand that she has uh, been recently studying the European perform uh, performativity of Muslims, Muslims in Europe, which will be the subject subject of her of her talk today. Uh, the talk is entitled "Witnessing the Sublime: Sophie Sama in Secular France." 
Please join me welcoming Deborah Kapchan to what promises to be an excellent and entertaining talk. my eyes. <laughs> I'm so honored. It's really a grace to be here uh, with uh, scholars that have influenced me so much and uh, whom I respect so much. I'm going to put my timer on. Uh, regular, where are you? Okay. Uh, and, and thank you, particularly regular, for inviting me and Michael for your hospitality. Uh, regular, originally asked me to talk for 20 minutes, and then I saw I had an hour. Um, I'm not going to exceed 30 minutes, and this is why I would very much uh, welcome your, um, your comments, your insights, uh, as we think together, because that's the most exciting part of this academic gig, right, is to think together and to be together as well. I have been a student of Sufism since at least 1993, uh, though I only started publishing on it mm, about five years ago. But I've been researching the Qadari of Chichia order in uh, Morocco, which is the largest order of Su Sufism in Morocco. Indeed, it, um, it's recently become quite an official order insofar as uh, the Minister of Religious Affairs is uh, in this order. I've been thinking a lot about paradox. And I would say all of my research uh, these days uh, is about listening. Of course, you know, Sufis are all about listening. Sama uh, is a, uh, a genre, and in Moroccan dialect, um, Sama is both the genre of Sufi song and, of course, the act of doing it, right? The kept sama, you listen, um, and you listen deeply. Um, in fact, people who participate in this genre are not called mghaniyin, singers, but they're called msanayin, listeners. Right? So, in fact, the, the listener and the sound are interchangeable. Um, let's see. Uh, so I, I started doing research in 1993 in Morocco. I was on Fulbright at that time. I was there for 14 months. I've been back uh, more or less every summer, uh, except for the last couple of years. And um, my research, of course, was with the women. And I really immersed myself in the song tradition because it's so compelling. But then in 2008, I, I went to France. And in fact, this order, like many, uh, like many religions, we, we're experiencing this rise in religiosity all over the world, right? Um, it is not at all the disenchantment, the promised, uh, the very disenchantment of the world, but rather uh, fervent uh, revival of religious emotion uh, and, and public affect, if you will. So when I went to France and, and began my research with the women in the order there, most of them were second and third generation North African women, some of them French converts. But of course, the difference between doing research uh, and participating with, uh, in, in Sufi ceremonies in Morocco, where everyone is speaking Arabic, and France, is that in France, the second and third generation uh, North African French citizens did not speak Arabic. Well, what does this necessitate? It necessitates the transliteration, I'm sorry, but the, this just looks like a blur, but here is the Arabic the, uh, part of the liturgy, instead of the and here is the transliteration, and you know there are two asterisks here and one here, so there, the breath marks uh, are noted, the phrasing is noted. And what I discovered when I was um, attending these ceremonies, I mean, it was amazing how beautiful the Arabic was. And when I asked people, did they speak Arabic? No. It was all through deep listening 
that they got it. Now this happens all over the Islamic world, where you know where people don't speak Arabic. But <clears throat> what what I noticed is that they began they learned the beginnings of phrases, the ends of phrases, and then they would kind of weave in the in between as as they went. And that was in a sense a process of initiation. So what I saw happening was a kind of competence in listening that was being enacted. And it was this competence in listening, or literacies of listening, I at the time liked the L's, um, that was key in, in a kind of the spread of, uh, of Sufi, Sunni Islam, as well as a, a kind of initiation into, uh, into this order. So I, I, listened, I did a lot of listening to people listening. So there are many ways to listen, of course, right? And one, one of the things that I'm very interested in now, along, along with many scholars, is, is putting, is understanding the nuance of listening acts. Because listening acts are not, as we might have assumed just 20 years ago, passive, but they are quite active. So I, I, I kind of draw upon Austin's notion of speech acts, which perform something in the world, to think about how listening itself transduce, transduces sound and transforms it. Right. So while we have many, our vocabulary, the elaboration of speaking genres or literary genres is vast, we really are just starting to put uh, words to the categories for listening, right? So deep listening, Kasabian does ubiquitous listening, uh, we may have Michel Chion who does reduced listening, which is listening to sound as sound, or semantic listening. Um, so we're, we're beginning to, under, to understand the, the, the genres or methods of listening that are, um, that we employ, but Usually they stay well, under the threshold of uh, consciousness, right? And it's not until, so what are the rules for listening in different contexts? It's really not until these rules are broken, which is so often the case in any kind of genre, uh, that we realize what they are, right? So listening, um, in fact, has a, a very deep relation to obedience. Uh, it comes to obey uh, and to listen in Latin, or, uh, or to hear anyway, or connected. But listening is also, um, it's, it's a discipline, right? It's how we intellectually listen, constantly uh, telling people to, to listen. And then, um, So, I, I've been thinking about listening as witness. I've also been thinking that about sound knowledge. So, I'm in the performance studies department, and performance studies is, at least at the New York University, we are saturated in theory, 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 theory. Our students, as all well, our students want to know, um, and we can. Uh, become rather involved in, 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 in theorizing. But I have been thinking about listening as method, right? And how method itself is a kind of knowing. So <clears throat> what are the methods, you can say genres, but we can also talk about methods of listening that <clears throat> help us do things in the world. And what does it mean to witness, to be, to be an oral witness? So I'm an ethnographer. Um, I, I, I'm almost a religious ethnographer. If I have a religion, it is ethnography slash poetry. And thank you for those beautiful poems. Um, but what does ethnography do? You know, so I've, I've been extremely, like I'm sure you all have troubled by the recent events. And you know, I was in New York in 9-11. Um, somehow, 
maybe it was because of the trauma, maybe it was because of the shock. Somehow the Charlie Hebdo attacks in Paris uh, moved me even more. Uh, or, or maybe I had a little bit of a distance on them, but they were profoundly disturbing to me. And in part because when I am in France, I am always between these two worlds of uh, virulent, secular, lefty uh, people and practicing devout <coughs> And I, I go back and forth between these worlds uh, often with ease, but then when things like the Shabli Abdu attacks happen, all of a sudden uh, you feel a, a, a deep clash. So <clears throat> I'm very interested in the ethical responsibility of the listener and as of the listener, of the ethnographer as a listener, and how methods of listening uh, might offer another way, a non-new theory, comes from feria in Latin, which is to see, right? It's objective. It's something that objectifies and separates. Method is um, our listening, takes us, invites us into paradox. Because listening confounds subject and object. Listening brings us into sound. Sound is material. Sound connects us all materially. Um, that's also to be discussed to what extent and how. But <clears throat> what are the parameters of social listening? What is public listening, and how might listening as an ethnographic method take us into um, into place of gnosis that's not necessarily sacred or religious, but uh, that is connecting. So I thought about because of the conference on the sublime. Not I don't really use that word in my research, but of course that's all I'm studying. And in that beautiful uh, Phil, your the, the list of um, stations. One of the things I'm going to talk about, or I'm going to uh, that we're going to listen together, is uh, number two on that list. We had so it's never it's not very far up on the list, but it doesn't matter. Um, it, the The point is that we're listening to something. We're, we're going to witness something together. So I, I'd like to ask you to listen with me. And. I apologize, uh, and this is things I just put up mnemonics for me, but um, this is a particular solution. These are these are women who are listening. Um, so uh, I will stop for a second and say that I I know I mentioned sound knowledge, but the way I define sound knowledge is as a non-discursive form of affective transmission resulting from acts of listening. So what <clears throat> a very simple way um, to say this is, you know, if I if everybody if somebody on the street is looking up, you know, ultimately everybody's gonna start looking up. Right? There's there's a connection. So when when I what I suggest is if, if there's one deep listener in the room, it has the same effect. We're going to all be affected by this listening. Listening changes the energy of a social field. In fact, we can say, you know, call on Bourdieu's notion of field, you know, aesthetic uh, structuring, um, an aesthetic structure of a, of a place or a, a habitus as a kind of sonic field, a sound field, a field of listening. Um, so let's listen together. Uh, well, let me just bring your attention to this. Is that what does it mean to listen as a witness? So what is an oral witness? And I, I'm really into etymology. I know it's not terribly surprising. In fact, I meant to do this blind, but I didn't. But the witness oh, comes from uh, it, it's not just see. I usually say I, I, I saw it, I witnessed it, as if it was something that was sight. But in fact, the etymology. Uh, comes from an attestation of fact, an event from personal knowledge, from a kind of experience, right? Personal knowledge, 
And one who so testifies, it meant knowledge, wit, and was a literal translation of the Greek martis, martyr, right? Which before it came to mean a sacrifice was related to care, trouble, and also to memory and mindfulness. So to witness, uh, uh, I'd like to suggest, is not just to know, but it is also tra to transmit that knowledge and to do so publicly, that is to testify. So, so witness this with me. I hope this will work. My, my sheikh is, is uh, like a white dove living in my soul and satisfying me. My love is in Madakh, which is where he lives in the north, he's still alive. And let's go, let's go there and, and meet him. Um, clearly, uh, the, listen, the listeners to this are appreciating this beauty and respond in kind of taught up fashion with a la la la. But it breaks down, or maybe that's not the right word. It transforms. It transforms as people go into the head. Now, the head state is something that is supposedly uh, divinely inspired. It's not under your own volition. Uh, it, it breaks through, if you like, in kind of Delheimsian way. It breaks through one dimension to another. It, it's something that is. Um, kind of a portal to, uh, to Tawheed, to unity, even if it's not uh, Tawheed. In, uh, in other publications, I won't go into it now, but you, know, you can analyze this piece, but other pieces as well. What happens is you know, there's people go into a hell and they listen to each other closely. So one hell brings on others. And not only that, the rhythms, and this won't surprise anybody who's read the Thetha on rhythm analysis, the rhythms of one head will kind of be um, you know, contrapuntal to the ostinato of the da 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 And then the, the other rhythms of the head will come in. People respond to those rhythms, and it, it takes off. You know, think 
lifts up over sounding, for those of you who know Steve Wells' work, or participatory discrepancies, for those who know Charlie Kyle's work. You know, things that characterize improvisation in general, this very subtle listening to aesthetic nuance and the iterations of it in kind of other forms happen all the time. So not only in liturgy and in the Vicar uh, and in the Sema does listening happen, but in these improvisations of head, people are listening deeply and responding to each other. Uh, now, why is this a witness and what are we risk witnessing? You know, I, to analyze these sounds, the meaning of these sounds, uh, I, I is particularly, is, is exactly what I would rather not do. Uh, rather, my question is what do these sounds do? What does the materiality of these sounds do? What do they, they produce when they generate? But also, what does listening to these sounds do? How is being an oral witness to these sounds? Um, Well, let me go back to the political context of France. These sounds are happening not in Morocco, right? This is France. This is France. What is the impact of, of, of this and of listening to this uh, in France? So I've, I've played this for academic audiences before, and I've gotten very interesting responses, so I'm looking forward to yours. One scholar, Islamic, the scholar of the Islamic world, uh, in Turkey actually said, do these women know that you're playing this in academic context? You know, for her, uh, my playing this was a, a like kind of illicit unveiling, uh, you know, a schizophonia that uh, took something out of its context and uh, was somehow sacrilegious. Another, in a very different city, uh, for a different conference, one another colleague said, you know, we can we can look at trauma. Uh, we can observe it, but when we listen to it, it's unbearable. So, trauma, right? This is rapture, but it's not. So, it, it, it gets back to the uh, things that have come up actually uh, in several contexts already, is this, um, and paradox as well. Uh, this is sacred and the profane, uh, pain and pleasure, uh, where is that? very, very thin line. What I would suggest, one thing that I would like to suggest, is that it is the head in the liturgy that sounds like trauma, not the songs, not the chants, the appearance of the personal voice amidst others. But even more disturbing than the singular voice that breaks with the sonic field of a head, in a head, that is, is its recklessness, recklessness. When in this state, song transforms into cries, harmonies into dissonances, subjecthood as we know it dissolves. Listening to such a breaking apart is different than observing it, it's true. To listen to the explosion of subjectivity brings us into intimacy, another word that's come up quite a bit. Uh, it brings us into intimacy, and sometimes with total strangers. Right? What do we do with that? into coexistence, into intimate coexistence with strangers. I'm not obviously reading, so I just I want to consult my notes a little bit if you don't mind. Um, so what, what does the sublime do? Uh, and I have a Response if I can find it. Okay. No. Well, I won't spend time. Oh, here. Okay. So, what I suggest the sublime does is I quote myself. <laughs> It displaces, it displaces the human from the center of experience, putting ways of being before ways of knowing, and enacting unexpected intimacies that confound rational understanding. 
insisting rather upon an aesthetic pedagogy that we might refer to as being with paradox. Okay. Uh, so how does this help us make sense of the political political field in which we find ourselves? How does this interact with the very real circumstances on the ground in France uh, for Muslims who are practicing uh, Sufis? What does being an oral witness help us do in these contexts? Well, one of the things I would like to leave you with, and there's my 25 minute mark, <laughs> Let me just read the, the last two paragraphs that way I lose myself again. I have glasses on. So while social education teaches us when it is appropriate to use different speech genres, as I mentioned, the rules for listening are less explicit. Um, when humans hear what social codes dictate is not meant for some years, it produces a particular form of emotion in the listener. Often shame, embarrassment, or pity, maybe anger or agitation. Because sound touches us so intimately in our very organs and viscera, questions of intentionality, who a sound is intended for or not, are literally moving issues. So, Ethnographers who do research on religion inhabit a very vulnerable and thus productive place. We are often uh, either accused of being apologists for religion, of going native, or objectifying in a kind of orientalist way. Uh, we're either in it or we're out of it, and it's very hard to be in between. What the sublime does, however, is put us in a space of between and insist that we linger there, listening. At a moment when philosophy and theory announced the end of meta-language and representation, at uh, least some theories that I'm reading, attuning ourselves to the materiality of the in-between, to the place of instability, to moments upon moments of openness, is a method that may be more politically viable than any theorization. Now, I can't help but think that uh, Ibn Arabi would have agreed, but you'll tell me, Michael, if you wouldn't. Uh, his focus was on ontology as much as epistemology. He acknowledged the materiality of the imagination, of the spiritual realm, uh, of the corporeal realm, and of God. He was, <coughs> he acknowledged as well the paradox that was the very portal into other forms of knowledge. It was necessary to embrace the paradox of God is and God isn't. Hua, lesa, hua. In order to accede to other levels of gnosis. Ibn Arabi also stressed that humans could never fully understand God, who is only ascertained through symbols. Adam. Indeed, uh, Ibn Arabi's God, this might be some stretch for you, but I've been reading Mayasu. Ibn Arabi's God was a bit like mathematics in, in Mayasu, if you read after infinity. In other words, a symbol is not a representation for Ibn Arabi, but a material reality. Insofar as he acknowledged that God is unknowable, Ibn Arabi proceeded to phenomenologists who stress that objects are always, in some sense, withdrawn. Side of the coin. For many contemporary philosophers, this is precisely why we need to attune ourselves to objects on a vibrational level, and why we need to accept that humans cannot know everything, but that we need to respect everything. Ibn Arabi also asks us to let go of human and our humanist prejudices that would have the tree falling in the forest make no sound. So does this solve the problem? political problems of power? Does it get rid of fanaticism? Does it demystify uh, at all? No. Listening to the sublime with intention, however, 
is a method that teaches us how to be in a world in beauty as well as in chaos and instability. It is an intervention in what we might call slow ethnography or slow activism, an incremental transformation in the long delay. It ought to be, I think I've handled on this a long time ago. Uh, and if, and if, and I'm deliberately popping up here, and if the terrorists that attacked Shabi and Bill could inhabit the paradox of God is and God isn't, and if the cartoonists could inhabit the paradox of secular is and secularism isn't, dreams are sublime. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deborah, for this very intriguing and thought-provoking uh, lecture. I specifically like uh, the, uh, the, the different ways and uh, methods of listening that you uh, uh, propose, and especially the reduced listening. Uh, I know now what my undergraduate students are doing in class. <laughs> 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 Uh, anyways, if, if I, I mean, we'll open up to questions, but I would like to start with a, with a very short uh, question. And uh, you said that these second and third generation uh, North African Muslims in France do not necessarily speak Arabic that well. So I'm, uh, I, I want to ask if these women that are reacting uh, in the, in the uh, part you played for us. Were they reacting to the text, or were they reacting to the to the recital performance? Mm -hmm. that, that's a wonderful example, and in fact, uh, I think that Sidi Hamza, who is the Sheikh of the Order uh, in the genealogy of the Prophet, living near the border of Algeria, uh, I'm sure they know that they are speaking about Sidi Hamza. They're mentioning his name, um, so. Clearly, the deeper you get into listening to these songs, the more they take, they inhabit you. Um, and this one, in particular, was in Moroccan dialect. So I, I won't say that the women who are responding are responding only to the sound, but I will, in this example, because the, the sheikh is mentioned. But in other examples, and I have many of them, uh, it is much more abstract. That is, they are not uh, understanding necessarily what they are singing, but rather it is being taken up in an affective wave, in a sense that uh, that moves around the world. That around the, uh, that was that was a slip that I meant to say around the room, but maybe it moves around the world as well. They might also have some pre-knowledge about the text. If, it, if it's performed again and again, they yeah. might just know when, right. what comes. Right. And it is performed again and again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, kind of a related question. Is there um, any interest in uh, composing and performing songs in French that sort of echo the same meaning? I've heard, for example, in Ingrid, there's, um, I think, some mention, have a that have started to compose in English. Yeah. And also related to that, um, to what extent have has the story been in France? Have they attracted people that are not Muslim um, into their uh, yeah? Uh, there have been no songs, to my knowledge, in French or English or any other language other than Arabic, and I think that's very compelling, actually, because uh, though not surprising, since Arabic is a sacred language, uh, and this order is uh, is. It, it's not what a former colleague of mine used to talk about, in, and with, with all due respect, however, he, he, he talked about as goofy Sufis. Um, the order that I'm working with, uh, you're a Sufi, you, you do the five pillars of Islam, you pray, you fast, and then you do your dhikr, and then you go to the wadifa. You know, it's, it's over and above all your obligations as a Muslim uh, in this order, and to 
I've seen it, I've, I've never gone to the orders in England, but it's in England, it's in Belgium, it's in France, it may be in Spain, it's in the United States, in the Washington DC area, there's a chapter in San Francisco, so it's in Canada, uh, in Montreal, and to my knowledge, no songs, it's always Arabic, it's always Arabic. Uh, and the other question was, introduced from non Moroccans in Jordan. Um, oh yeah, well there are there are actually quite a few French women um, here, and I am always intrigued about their stories and what got them into the tariqa. Uh, always there's a, a kind of search, um, but there is sometimes a key person in their life, a husband, uh, a family member, who opens that door for them. Uh, yeah, that's about as much as I can say. But there are quite a few converts. Quite a few converts. Yeah, sorry. Hi, I have uh, two quick questions that are, I think, related to your theory and uh, the performance. So the first one is um, the idea of the, the listening community and the sort of management of ecstasy. So in the Kavali tradition, if somebody goes into a hall, they're and maybe Rachel already talked about this, but there's a certain, you know, certain rules that you try not to shape, you try not to disturb that person while they're in hall. So the musicians keep repeating the line, right. and the, the shake comes up and, you know, tries to maybe calm the person, or there's, there's a certain kind of reintegrating the person who's kind of gone out there. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to me that just hearing the Wuchishi uh, performance, that it, it was that everybody kind of launching into the into the sicker, and I'm wondering if there was something about the sound community and the reintegration and management of ecstasy. That that's the first question. Mm -hmm. And then the second one is um, as you're speaking about paradox, I got interested in the idea of transgression mm -hmm. and how um, you know the background of those words or maybe the imagery of, um, of the experience. So so in other words. Somebody who's in a hall, and, yeah. and again, I'm not familiar with the Lali tradition, mm -hmm. but the idea that maybe they can break certain rules, or like, you know, mm -hmm. to what extent they can break rules, right. and, and how is that um, uh, ecstasy or maybe sublimity mm -hmm. also potentially transgressive? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, I'm not expecting that you necessarily, have to, I'm just putting that out there that no. there could be another way of talking. It's very interesting, and uh, I think that. You know, you're not supposed to look at anybody who's in the head, which for a newcomer, when I was a newcomer, is uh, a difficult thing not to do when somebody next to you starts <laughs> to scream and go uh, move their body. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, you get accustomed to the fact that people's states change and then you don't look, uh, you listen, right? And, and so, Management of a head is interesting. It's an interesting term. I, I would say it's care, you know, because it, people need sometimes to be cared for uh, and attended to, and that's certainly the case. Um, so there's a, a heightened attention to people in different states. But I think the whole notion of transgression in those moments flies out the window because. Uh, they are divinely inspired. So it's not about a, a transgressing, it's about our response, I think. Uh, it's just off, my, off the top of my head. Um, fascinating paper. I had a bunch of thoughts on it and questions, um, and including the, what you just mentioned is it transgression, or is this socially approved in that yeah. context yeah. that it's something that's regarded favorably? Yeah. Um, I was wondering also um, uh, uh, along the lines of what um, Hans was asking, you know, um, how did these women speak of it? For example, there was one, it felt like one woman, one woman was weeping. Mm -hmm. Would she or others describe that as sadness, as in some sort of Shia event where they were letting market on the property and so on? Um, or is it just a state of being moved? And, um, uh, and then moving on from that, um, it's a different question, but I mean, I love the whole emphasis you put on audition and their own responses, and maybe the idea that in some ways 
it's not so much, especially when they don't understand the Arabic necessarily, uh, not so much their, you know, that message or the influence, but rather that they are using this event um, to achieve their own sort of uh, catharsis, as has been said of the 13-year-old girl in 1956 listening to Elvis Presley and screaming and swooning. And uh -huh. Is that Elvis's effect on her, or is it sort of using... I mean, it's shifting the emphasis again to the, yeah. the Salah aspect. Yeah. Uh, though, this is where I think we might get into trouble, trouble, or, you know, to interpret this, uh, you know, is this catharsis, is it divinely inspired, is it, uh, use, is she using it for her own purposes, can we equate it with Elvis Presley? Those are all interesting questions, but I also think that uh, we, need, we need to focus on what we really haven't too much before, and that is, what do these sounds do? Not in a psychoanalytic sense, but the materiality of these sounds. Um, how do we live with something that is unbearable in the long term? I, uh, quoting this colleague who said it was unbearable. How can we be with a self that's coming apart? And that, for me, is the intervention. And I'll tell you why. I'm thinking, because I'm, I'm thinking particularly of some of the reactions of my lefty friends to the Shabli Abdo attacks, which were horrible, fanaticism, murder, right? But the recourse, and I, I think this isn't, often the case to everyone who is unmoored is to patrimoine, heritage, point de repère, kind of anchors uh, to one's home and, and being. And, and of course history, 1968, 1789, right? And I, I, I could show you uh, a, a site published by the French government uh, stopjihadism.gov.fr, uh, which uh, tells you how to how to spot it, how to know if your neighbor is a jihadist, and it, it's uh, it's delirant, as they say. Right? I mean, it's just so shocking because what it's doing is imposing a surveillance uh, of uh, neighbor to neighbor. And one of the things is a baguette. And there's a cross against the baguette. You know, they won't eat. They change their eating habits, they change their sartorial practices, they don't watch television, and all. But more than that is, is the fact that there's a surveillance that's being imbricated, or, you know, I don't, I don't know if this, I'm responding to your, your comment, but what, it seems to me that in this world that is transforming and shifting, and it's earthquake, right? It's an earthquake. The ground is constantly, constantly moving. You know, we have a few responses. We can go back to our caves or our homes or, or, and build up a whole lot of rocks around what is us against them. But, you know, in terms of how ethnography and ethnographies of listening might make an intervention incrementally, you know, drop in the bucket, but but I think that's all we can do right now at this point in history is a drop in the bucket, is to be able to listen to instability without retreating into even interpretation, um, without retreating into our comfort zone of identity politics and, and such. And for me, listening has this potential, you know, and and I'm going out a little bit on a tangent here, but you know, it's not a new thing. The Thich Nhat Hanh, Buddhist activist, you know, has been talking about this for a long time, compassionate listening. How to stay in a place where you're not comfortable and not close your ears and your heart. And so, perhaps for this audience, you are disturbed by these sounds because you probably have heard them and they're not exotic. 
But for some people, they're profoundly disturbing. How then do we stay and listen to them? And I think that is the ethnographic, because that's what I am, right? That, that's so what? Uh, that's what many of us are. But I'm saying that you know, my, I can only move from my positionality and the ethnographic response to some of these horrific uh, events and, and moments in which we live. I think listening has a great potential to. be an ethical response. Um, yeah. Stop there. Yeah. Um, I wanted to um, ask you a little more about the part of the discussion that focused on the materiality of sounds and the yeah. auditory movement of sounds across fields or across communities. Um, and I can't remember the exact language you were using when you quoted a couple uh, studies on this, but it, it strikes me as related to the question about what people might understand of the earth. So I would assume that uh, although the uh, members of the order do not know Arabic in terms of classical grammar and vocabulary. They hear the Quran, and um, they are, in fact, you know, to me, this is an essential element of an auditory culture: is that the Quran is primarily heard, and it's heard in all contexts, and people that might not have ever be educated in uh, classical Arabic in school, uh, gradually come to know it, in many cases come to know large parts of it with a kind of affective, uh, affective understanding of what is happening rather than um, a uh, lexical, semantic understanding. So I had the experience of talking to people that uh, can recite a surah with perfect syntactical inflection. And then when I asked them to make a transliteration sound chart along these lines, they didn't know where one word ended and another word began. Exactly. And to me, this is, um, uh, so this whole auditory culture that is um, intertwined with the Quran um, and the movement of auditory uh, 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 religion and a culture, a religious culture, that is so based on hearing as, a, as the prim primary modality in some ways of, uh, of um, approaching uh, that which is sublime or sacred or uh, that, that which will break in the kind of path. So I just couldn't help but think of that when you were talking about the um, notion of what one understands yeah. from the from the uh, uh, from whatever is being performed as the cement. Yes, and of course when you talked about your project at, at Chicago and how you hope to chart out the rhythms of of poetics. It's, it's that, right? We're making a score, in a sense, of a kind of vibrational score that is about movement and rhythm and intonation and in a kind of ethnopoetic sense, right? Uh, but the kinds of knowledge that are transmitted, I mean, that's where I think, you know, the academy, um, we, we live here. A lot of the time, and I, you know, I include myself. You know, somehow we are, especially in for in graduate education, uh, above our eyebrows and somehow a little bit above the top of our head. But there are so many forms of knowledge, you know. And people who are musicians, this is why it's like talking to the converted, because I'm sure a, a lot of you are. Um, 
in conservatory education, but people put their hands on your shoulders. They put your, their hands on your on your diaphragm. They say, breathe down here. Um, you know, put your shoulders down. Bring the air into the upper things of your um upper cavities of your mouth, and that's completely fine. But in the you know in the academy, we focus on a very small. A kind of knowing, an intellectual knowing, which is wonderful. I'm not, I'm not an anti-intellectual at all. But to recognize that there are other forms of knowing, and what's being transmitted in those sounds that people don't understand is something else. And how can we attune ourselves to that? And you know, I have to read a, a, one more quote to you before, because Jane Bennett, if you know Jane Bennett's work. Uh, Vibrancy, vibrant matter. She says, uh, this is a problem, I never get it. All right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll look for it while somebody else asks us a question. If there's time, they said. In the interest of time, maybe we shall maybe take two more questions and then we'll move. Uh, I can just turn mine quickly in the comments, but I'm curious, you know what? After the Shani Abdul, that's we also heard in the media the comments around saying, see, you <laughs> listen to us. And so I'm wondering, you know, you did talk about your 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 poem master now support the friends. When you were setting up the leftist friends with the, you know, the other world that you did, there's another world. Oh absolutely. Well. And I wonder what how do they listen? How do they think about listening and the limits of listening? And I also, this is just a comment that mm -hmm. I just pulled out there, but the, you know, how would you parse the difference between listening and hearing mm -hmm. and the implications for where we locate agency? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's great. And you know, listening, um, I mean, hearing is often in, in the literature I've read what we happen to hear, you know, uh, by virtue of being hearing people or sense if we are deaf, but, uh, and listening is more of an active uh, listening too, to tendre la l'oreille, as Sandy says, and you know, you, you lend your ear. Um, so I think that there is a, a, a subtle difference between, I and mean, this is what Kasabian calls a kind of ubiquitous listening, that we're constantly listening because there's sounds all around us, and there's the pipes and the water running in the pipes, and the sound of the electricity, and all the things that are below my fresh, threshold of consciousness that are informing my nervous system and yours. Mm -hmm. uh, but then popular music, music. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, just to finish my thought, um, the Pont National, of course, are they listening? Um, I, I, I'm not sure that they're listening. <laughs> I, I think that they're responding. And you see, when I, I, I make a, a real, it's so complicated. It's so complicated because um, how people spin the media, how they spin violence, and the response to violence, you know, when you're talking about the long durée, when you're talking about incremental or uh, you know, slow activism, um, that means not just hanging with uh, just instability, it's hanging with death and destruction and, and, and horror. Uh, for a long while, right? It's, it, so it's 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 a particular position, and you know, I, the, the, the Front National is Front National is frightening. There was one question over there, then regular, and then we'll stop. Um, I wanted to ask you about this uh, rule uh, of uh, not looking at the person in hand. Uh, yeah. um, is it because of the possible effects on the onlooker or on the person being huh. looked at, or is there something else? That you... That's a great question, you know, um, I, and I, I've really never asked it. They, you know, I, my my Arabic is, that I speak is, is Moroccan. They say masik shuf, then masik shuf, behind the head. You just can't look at somebody who's in the head. That's because it's impolite, uh, is my understanding. Is is there is? Um, I don't think it's a danger so much as it is. Is it inclusion? Yeah. 
It's a very personal experience, I think that's why. <laughs> well, look, at th this is really interesting because one of the things that listening does, and listening to these kinds of intimate things, is it puts us smack in front of personal, what is personal, what is social, what is public, uh, what is intimacy, with whom can you be intimate, you know, so my response, but it's an intellectual response because no one has ever told me this, it is, it is just from my being there, is that listening, we are joined. As soon as you open your eyes, you're making that person an object and it, it's jarring, it takes you out of the head because you are in the, the cinema of, uh, of appearances, right? But when your eyes are closed, you're in a vibrational field, uh, you know, social field of listening that is more continuous. That would be my response, but again, that's my response, not. If I can just make a very quick comment on this question of transgression. Because in the Hindu context of the moment, uh, there is a close relationship between trans and transgression. Yeah. And, and if you look at the Muslim context, I mean, what perhaps in this summer, I'm not sure, but that kind of halal is very next to see. Yeah. And basically, transgressed. Yeah. Yeah. Not necessarily you know, the wrong thing. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, right. And, you know, there, so there is obviously a, a relation between transgression, trans, uh, transformation, um, all of these things. but. The notion of transgression only occurs against, and this is in all sorts of genre theory, right? You can only transgress a line if you have a line, right? So when all of, of the, the categories are up for grabs, then where is transgression uh, at the top, right? So. Uh, in the beginning, you talked a bit about theories, and there is a great deal of Right now. You said there's a lot of theories of theorizing. I'm really interested in how you heard how you are as an ethnographer and as a person uh, in these conditions. How do you see theorists? How do you choose? Do you find some, you know, oh, this, this theory seems to confirm what I've observed? Or, this is a famous person, or whatever. I mean, <laughs> how do you deal with that? Because you, you know, you, you're so very sensitive to the identities and to the relationships that you have. Then, what's, what to do about theory? Yeah, no, that, I think that's a great question. What to do about theory, and what is the place of theory? And you know, in, in a sense, it's my bread and butter. Uh, in, in the department where I am, and you know, I'm uh, a bit of a philosophical gymnast or, or junkie or whatever term you might want to say. It's, it's fun for me to read a lot of these things. I find it extremely stimulating um, and thought-provoking, um, and I, I and I thank my colleagues and my graduate students, you know, who are constantly putting me in front of new materials. It's brain exercise, and I think that's really, really important. But then, uh, to what extent does it illuminate and, and actually, uh, and that, that's where I think that method has gotten really bad rap. And, and that, in fact, it, method for me is, you know, it's, it's almost an aesthetic. It is kind of like a taste, it has a taste, the word method um, for me, but it, it's something that uh, does something. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about method and how method and theory are, are very joined and we can't take them apart. Uh, and maybe perhaps, yeah, uh, we can, of course, we can take them apart, but what happens when we don't? Um, take them apart. And the one thing I will close with in that, and that is, I do, I am very stimulated by the philosophies and theories that I'm reading on ontology, because I find them really refreshing. That uh, people are talking about, you know, so I'm, I mentioned Mayasu, um, but um, 
I think Timothy Morton is out of the box and, and really exciting. You know, his book, Hyper Objects, which uh, talks about the fact that the world has already ended, the world that we know it has already ended. Uh, yeah, and in fact, uh, rationality and irrationality are problems. But anyway, that's, that's my essence. But ontology, because the more I read an ontology, the more I, Ibn Arabi comes to life for me. And he was such a visionary in so many ways. But of course, I just know him in translation. <laughs> thanks to people translated. Well, many thanks, Deborah, for a very interesting talk and discussion. Maybe we can uh, chat a bit over lunch. I don't know when we'll be reconvening or, or sticking to the so it's supposed to be one o'clock, but it's already twelve thirty. So one fifteen, okay. Thank you very much. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.